Well, good morning, Calvary. Good to see everybody. Glad that you're here. Uh, if you are visiting with us, thank you for coming to Calvary. We're, we're glad to see you. Uh, you should have received a bulletin on your way in. This is your way to get to know us just a little bit, a way for us to introduce ourselves. But we'd also like to get to know you. So on the inside, there is a connection card. If you could pull into that trifold, rip that out, fill that out, and then put that in the uh, offering plate as it comes by later in the service, we'd really appreciate that. It's our way to get to know you a little bit too. But it's not just for you guys, it's also for our, our members and regular attenders. That's for everybody to fill out. So everybody feel like you can fill out that, that card that we would love to have everybody fill that out. But also on there, you'll see the invest and invite option. Make sure that you're thinking through or have already been praying through some people to invite to our Easter service. So I pray that you take advantage of that. Um, it's March. We're in the middle of March Madness. Anybody been watching any basketball? Okay, good. Some great upsets already, and so it's, it's always fun to do that. And it's great to see uh, people get excited about something and to cheer and uh, go a little crazy and things like that. Uh, and it makes me think about when we gather together, why do we gather together every week? It's because we have something that's better than basketball, something that's better than being a fan of something. Uh, we're not just fans, we are included in the family of God if you are a Christian today. And so it is worth it to gather together. It is worth it to be together and to sing and to listen to the truth about God. We need him so much. And so it's great that you're here today and that we are going to do this together. Let's open up with Psalm 95, which says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. So let's stand together and let's sing to this Lord of ours. We sing, look and see.
hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My warning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace is so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life did for us on the cross and because of his mercy
and his love for us. He's where our hope lies. into a Christian family and I grew up in the church and it wasn't until I was in grade school that I asked my parents um, what everything about Jesus and salvation what it was all about and they um, they sat me down and they discussed it with me and I got saved and then some years later when I um, was in my junior high years I began to doubt um, if I was saved because I didn't remember every detail of it happening and then my mom reassured me and I rededicated my life to Christ. But it really wasn't until my college years when I um, went on my first missions trip to New York that I really um, began to have a love for Jesus and a passion for the gospel and to spread the gospel. And so ever since then, um, my love for Jesus has grown and I have strived to live for Him every day. And as for baptism, I've always um, knew it was something that I needed to do but I always just put it off, and then I realized I was um, disobeying God, and I needed to do it, so I'm doing it. <laughs> but we're going to celebrate Cassie coming to be baptized this morning. So Cassie, I'm going to ask you a few questions here. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. Do you believe he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and died in the place of sinners? Yes. Do you believe after three days in the grave he rose again in victory? Yes. And then do you believe that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Yes. 
Cassie, what is your confession? Jesus is Lord. Well, Cassie, based on that profession of faith, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. Even if you didn't get to see the video, right? By the way, she doesn't, she, she doesn't stutter, so it's, that's, but um, it's great to be able to be a part of the family of God and see baptisms like this happening, uh, to see God working in hearts. He is a Lord that is king over all and that works in hearts to bring about uh, people proclaiming, saying, you know, yes, I'm his and he is mine. And so what a wonderful thing that is and, and that we'd be able to see that together. So... Um, we are going to read a scripture passage in Psalm 99 today, and then we will pray. Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O oh Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy. Let's pray together. God, we're grateful for such a, a strong psalm that represents you so well in so many facets of your character. And God, first of all, we reflect on the fact that you are holy and the fact that, that you are so not like us, you are so perfect in all of your ways, you are untouchable, and yet we should not even be able to be praying to you as we are right now, uttering your name, singing your name as we have. We should not be able to be doing this, except for the fact that in your love and in your mercy, you show us mercy to allow, to allow us to speak your name, to sing your name, to sing praises to you. You are that holy. You are that set apart from us. And so we are grateful that we have such a Lord that is so set apart, so high and mighty. And yet, as we see, even in a few weeks from Easter, that you humble yourself and you, you cause yourself to be humbled and even death on a cross. And so, God, that is why we are able to speak to you right now. That is why we are able to pray. And so we love you. We are so grateful for the mercy that you have shown us, the love that you have shown us. And even as you showed the Israelites in the way that you, you gave them mercy, you let them experience consequences, you, you definitely take care of your people. And so we've seen that. If we name you as Lord, God, we've seen it. And so we thank you for it. We praise you for it. And so, Lord, we, we thank you also for your work in Bangladesh with the Archibalds. God, we pray that you continue to Help them as they are establishing their school and hiring new teachers. God, that they, uh, that in their partnerships with the recordings, that that would continue to go well, that you would keep the equipment strong as that is being done and help the professionals to, be, uh, to, to, to do, it, do their work well. God, that they would do it for you and that together as a team, God, that they would bring you glory. So we pray that that would be true. We pray that that would be true of our service today. Thank you for, uh, for allowing us to be here, for bringing us all here together, that it is by no mistake that every person that is here is here. God, I pray that you would open our ears, help us to, to look and to see you as you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now's the time in the service where we take a short break. It's a chance for our children to go to their uh, kids, Calvary Kids, that is out those doors and down the stairs. The rest of us, feel free to... Uh, have some coffee in the Welcome Center. So let's all stand, and we'll be back after this short break.
As you're making your way back to your seats, go ahead and remain standing. Well, even with that in mind, I just think of, man, Easter is two weeks away, two weeks from today. It's Easter Sunday, so next week, Palm Sunday, already, it's crazy. So I, I hope that these next two weeks that you are just thinking through, okay, who can I invite? How, how, who can I engage with and, and bring them to the Easter service? Because we want to we wanna just reach out. We want to be a, um, a people that lives on mission here. And Bloomington Normal is our mission field right here, and especially if you're living here. This is the, the people that God has placed around you. And so Easter, for whatever reason, people are more open to say, you know what, I'll come on Easter Sunday. And so are you thinking through who you can invest in, who you can invite to come be a part of this? Who are you praying for? Who are you, who are you engaging with to be able to say, man, God's placed me in their lives to be the light. And so how are, how are you doing at being the light? And so let me encourage us as a church, let's fill this place. Let's, let's see this place filled with just people are searching, people are skeptical 
people that are just wondering what the church life is all about and let's just come and let's just worship together and be a testimony of God's grace in our lives and, and pray that that's a testimony to them and that they would believe. That's what we, our prayer should be, especially in these last two weeks leading up to Easter. So, so be investing in people, being inviting uh, people. 24 hours of prayer is coming up on Good Friday. So at the end of the service today, go to the info center, sign up for an hour slot to come gather here um, within those 24 hours of Good Friday from midnight night to midnight and, and come pray together that God would just work and do an amazing thing on Easter Sunday. I want to encourage us as the entire church to be a part of this and be involved in this. Well, as we talk through the, uh, the series here on prayer, we're working through Matthew chapter 6. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them, turn to Matthew chapter 6 here. And we're going to talk, we're going to camp out in, in chapter 6 here today for the most part. We'll, uh, we'll jump to chapter 7 uh, towards the end. But Matthew chapter 6, if you need a Bible, there's one in a pew rack around you, page 671. You will find Matthew chapter 6 there, page 671. So Matthew 6, where we'll be, we're going to do, like we've been doing, just a little recap to kind of pour into what we're going to talk about today. And so, like we've been talking about the last two weeks, it's kind of like this trickle-down effect. And so it begins with, with verse 9, where Jesus is teaching us how prayer kind of begins, how it's shaped, and then everything kind of flows into that. So every week, we kind of want to start there and see how it just works into itself, each thing that Jesus is teaching us. And so I'll explain what that means as we work through it this morning. But Matthew chapter 6 Look at verse 9. Jesus says, Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So remember again, what Jesus is doing here as he's, as he's teaching us to pray. So he's saying this. That first and foremost, you begin with a right understanding of who God is, but also a right understanding or right acknowledgement of who he is. And so I love how he begins by saying this, that God is our Father. Have you ever thought about the, the depth of that statement, of that truth? That, that Jesus is saying, you, you approach God as our Father, as your Father. I mean, what a beautiful word. What a beautiful word that is to, just to describe who God is. Like, he's a, he's a Father to us. Now I know I, I stand up here a lot of Sundays and I talk about how crazy my kids are um, from time to time. And, and, and honestly, um, I want to be really careful with that because I, I, I don't want them growing up saying, like, goodness gracious, Dad, like every Sunday you're going to tell us of something stupid I did. So I want to be careful of, of not to, throwing them under the bus um, that often up here. But as crazy and hectic as our life may be sometimes and as they make our lives sometimes, I, I just love them. I just love them. Like, I really love being a dad. I just do. I love being around them. I love playing with them. I love wrestling with them. And even when you have to discipline them, when I'm disciplining them, it, it, it's not changing. Like, though I'm disappointed in what they've done, but it doesn't change my love for them. Like, that my love for my kids is constant. It's just constant. And, and a good dad, a, a good father, is going to kind of create, like, a, a sense of safety for their children. Like, kids feel safe when their dad is around. They just do. A, a few months ago, we were having a meeting here with the hospitality team in the upper fire set room. So it was full with, you know, probably about 60 to 70 people in there as we were talking through just hospitality here. And so Corey Berm was, was up front helping um, facilitate kind of one of the discussions with, with the entire room. And his little boy, like in the middle of Corey just talking, um, his little boy Hudson, if you ever met Hudson, man, he's a firecracker. He's awesome. Hudson just walks up like with complete confidence, like right up to him in front of the whole room and just started asking him a question. Like it, it didn't even matter if there was a room full of people listening what Corey was talking about, like he's up front, and, and Hudson's like, I got a question, oh, this is my dad, I'm going to go ask him, and just went right up to him just with boldness, just with boldness, and so in that moment, like we're all laughing, Corey just kind of bends down, hears this question, answer it, and Hudson's like, okay, and then just kind of walks off, like it was, it was just kind of this funny moment as I think with, about this, and just the, the sense of safety and security that like dads bring to their kids, like, like now think with me on that, like we get to, we get to, as God's children, approach the creator of the universe and we get to call him father like we get to come with this boldness and in a sense of like he's our dad he's our father like i just love that idea that that truth there don't don't miss the the depth of that statement of this truth i mean who in the world are we 
to approach God like this, with just confidence, to just come before him in prayer and just say, here's my needs, Here, here's what's going on in my life. But we can come to him, we can come to him as father because we're not coming in our own name, we're, we're coming through the name of Jesus Christ, we're coming through his name. See, the reason that my kids can approach me without really trembling, without fear, without anxiety, um, and, and with this kind of this, this knowledge that, man, dad's going to listen to me. I might not like what dad has to say or my response, but like they, they know they can come without fear uh, and, and that I'm going to at least listen to them. They, they know they can do that because they're, they carry my name. Like they're Hareens. Like I'm going to listen to them more than, than any other kids that would want to come and take my attention, right? Like, like they belong to me. They're, they're part of my family. See, we who believe and trust in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we carry his name. We carry his name. We belong to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, we can approach a, a holy God, a holy God, and we can call him Father. This, this is why our prayers end in Jesus' name. Like that's not just a a nice little cliche phrase we like to put at the end because we're like, how do we end this? Well, it's saying in Jesus' name. No, it's because that's the reality that we are only able to approach this holy God because we're coming in his name and we belong to him as his children. It's, it's, why, it's why scripture so often and throughout the New Testament gives this description of Christians as being in Christ, like we're in him. So, so when we're approaching a father, God, God's not seeing our sinfulness and our, our wickedness. He's seeing Christ who's covered us. We're coming in his name. This is why we can call him father. Don't miss just the, the beauty and depth of that statement. And so, so Jesus is teaching us that, that when we pray, begin here. Begin with this right understanding and this right acknowledgement of who God is. He's our father. He's holy. There's no one else like him. We come to him wanting no other name to be exalted, right? Like, like, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Like, we are coming, not claiming anything else other than the exaltation and the glorification of our Father. That's, that's our deepest desire. And Jesus is saying, begin there in prayer. Because if we don't grasp this first, this idea first, this reality, this truth first, then we will not pray rightly, especially, especially when it comes to understanding what we need, which is what we're talking about today. If, if we don't first understand who God is, who we are in light of him, we're, we're not going to be under, we're not going to be able to grasp or fully understand what it is that we actually need. If, if we do not first understand that what matters most in this life and in, and in this universe is the glory of God's name, then we will not pray rightly when it comes to asking God to meet our needs. We won't even understand what our needs are. So, so this is what we're going to spend the bulk of our time today on, just this understanding on how to pray for our needs. Be, because we should. Like, we don't want to make a mistake here. Like, God says, ask him, right? So we're going to see that today, even as we get to chapter 7. Like, so it's, it's not that our prayer should always just be about the exaltation and glorification of God's name. It shouldn't be just this, this, this worshipful experience where we're just talking about him and how awesome he is. He does say, no, come to me with your needs. So we, we absolutely do that. But he wants to lay this out for us, this pattern for us, and say, but there's a right way to do it. There is a right way to approach God and ask for your needs to be met. So we should pray for God to meet our needs because look at verse 11. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. Speaking of physical, tangible needs that we, that we have in our life. So I love that he doesn't leave this out because we're needy. I'm a needy person. And so I love that this is here. So, so, but know this, at the heart of every believer should beat, first and foremost, I'm going to be hitting this I mean, all day here. It should beat for the glory of God's name. Like the, the yearning of our soul, like the longing of our soul, the craving of our soul is that, that God's name be set apart, be hallowed, be revered, be respected, be holy. And then this right thinking, right, this right thinking of who God is, it begins to realign. We talked about this last week. It begins to realign our hearts to crave only that which is going to bring further glory and exaltation and worship to God's name. 
So that's what we're talking about here, this realignment of our, of our needs. They're being shaped by God's name. So, so the big picture here is that when it comes to, to asking God to meet our needs, our asking really begins with saying this, give me only, give me only that which is going to bring glory to your name. So think of it this way here. Here's our kind of big picture for this morning. Then I'm going to break it down into a few different questions that we ask. So, so here's our big picture. Our needs are to be shaped by God's name. Our needs are to be shaped, conformed, molded by God's name. So, so keep your fingers here in Matthew chapter 6. But turn, turn back to the book of Proverbs chapter 30. So turn to Proverbs chapter 30. I'll give you a few seconds to get there because I want you to see this, this passage. Proverbs 30, page 445, if you're using uh, the Bible in the pew rack. So Proverbs chapter 30, I want to read verses 8 and 9. So with this idea, again, of, of, of our needs being shaped by the glory of God's name, we really see this kind of practically laid out here in Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. Listen to what, listen to what he says here. It says, remove far from me, verse 8, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now now think about what we just read there. And think about what we're talking about. Think again about our big picture. All right, our needs are be shaped by the glory of God's name. Now let me ask us, what is the greatest desire of this author's petition? What's, What's he really, what's he ultimately after here? What is he ultimately asking for here? He, he's ultimately asking for the glory of God's name. Like that's more, more than anything, that's what he wants. He wants his God to be holy, to be hallowed, to be revered. So you see, it's, it's God who is our true source of wealth. It's God who is our true source of life. It's God who is our true source of joy. It's, it's in God himself that where we find we are to find the, the deepest longings of our lives, like that, that peace and the hope that we're searching for, that satisfaction, that joy that we just deep down foundationally want. Like God is the true source of all of that. So, so then when it comes then to the, the physical or the tangible needs of our, of our lives, what we ask for is shaped first by the reality that our deepest desires have already been met in him. So, so we're not looking to the things of this earth to fill that void, to, to figure out like the, the answer to the cravings that I have in my life for satisfaction and joy. We, we already have that in him. And, and so see, you start to see how our, God's name begins to kind of shape then what we're, what we're asking for. Everything's been met in him fully and completely. The deepest longings of our, of our soul we find in him. So this petition here that we just read in Proverbs is one that's, that's shaped, conformed, but by the glory of God's name. Like he's saying, he's saying more or less, give me only what I need to live so that my eyes remain on you because you are my treasure. Like that's what he's saying here. Give, give me only what I need to survive so that my eyes, my heart are constantly fixed on you. I mean, how, how countercultural is that kind of thinking? I mean, this is a, this is a radical shifting in our lives, isn't it? Like it is for me. That's, that is absolutely for sure. It's a radical shifting in my mind and heart and how I think of what I truly need in, in my life to, to make me happy. Like we live and we breathe in a, in a culture of abundance and this striving for excessiveness. And, and, the, and the philosophy behind all of it is, is simply this, is that the more that you have, the happier you'll be. That's the philosophy that the world has set before us. The more you have, the happier you'll be. So chase after stuff. Accumulate stuff. Live and chase after abundance. Live and chase after this excessiveness. And, and, then, and then once you get it, then you got to be waiting for the next new thing. And, that, and then the happier you'll be. It's like this constant pursuit and chase for things in our lives. And if we just have things and have these things that we need and filled up in our lives and our houses are filled and our garages are filled and our, everything else, then you'll be happy. That's the philosophy behind it all. And I'm guilty of that. That is the culture. That is the air that we breathe here. And I'm so guilty 
of this desire for excessive living. But, but what we just saw in Proverbs is that if, if the attitude that we have is that for us to be happy and successful, we just need more of what we already have, then, 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 then what Proverbs is saying, you're following into a dangerous trap of thinking that you don't need God. Now, before you start to think, all right, thanks for hurrying, thanks for, for making me feel guilty, right? Like, um, Spring break's next week. We're going on vacation. Yeah, th- thanks for laying this on me the, the, the week before we're heading out to Florida, wherever we're going. Like, that, like, should I cancel the trip? Is that what you're saying? Like, should we just do away with all that we have? Like, that, again, please hear me. That is not the point. Please hear me. That is not the point. If, if all you're hearing is, all right, well, I guess I have to live minimally in order for God to love me. That's legalism. That's not what we're saying. I'm not laying before us whatsoever here this morning this idea, this flow chart of here's all that you can have, and if you hit the ceiling, then you're living in sin and excessiveness, right? That's not what we're talking about. Because if we go down that route, we're just falling into legalism and thinking that the, based on the way that I live and what I have or don't have, then God will accept me. That's sin, That's not what we're talking about here at all. That's not the point that we've read here in Matthew 6. It's not the point of Proverbs 30. That's not going to be the point of anything we say today. So please hear me. If you're going on vacation, enjoy your vacation. Get some rest, right? Like you have my blessing to go and lay on a beach for a week. Just think of me back in Illinois because I'm not going, all right? (laughs) The point, the point is, is that our hearts, right, Our hearts, our minds are not to be set on things of this world to bring us the joy that we crave, but in God himself, who is our joy. That's the point. So so flip back to Matthew chapter 6. Hopefully you kept your finger there. Flip back to Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to see this just kind of laid out because Jesus is now going to spend the rest of chapter 6 really teaching on this idea that, that it's not about... The, the do's and the don'ts. It's about a heart attitude. It's about where your mind is set. It's about who you're fully trusting in and relying on to, to, to meet the deepest cravings and desires of your, of your soul. So Matthew chapter 6, look at, verse, look at verse 19. Jesus says this. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, so, so before you pray, give us this day our daily bread. I'm, I'm going to give us here as we close our time three questions to ask, to internally ask yourself before you even go before God to, to say, here's what I need. Here's three questions. So before you pray this prayer, ask yourself first this. What is my treasure? What is my treasure? If Christ is your treasure, that will will shift your thinking of what you truly need in this life. It just will. See, if if your life is, is driven by the desire to always have more than the next person that's next to you, then, then you are not in that moment. If that's, your, if that's your life, like you're comparing yourself to others and what they have and what you don't have or this idea like the, the, whatever you see in, in, on commercials or whatever, like I mean, if I just had that, oof, man, and there's kind of this like, ah, if I just had that, that would, man, that would, that would, that would solve something for me. Like if that's kind of our thinking and how we're kind of walking through life and, and be really careful because it's really subtle, it's really subtle in our lives, like where we think this. Because I, I know my heart, I'm like, well, yeah, I don't live that way. But, but look for those subtle clues in our lives where we do, where you're, when your heart kind of skips a beat for something new, right? That, that's, a, that's a flag that's just saying, guard yourself here. It, are you putting too much weight in this thing? If like a, a, a physical or tangible thing brings you this level of excitement, right? Like it's just not saying it's wrong, just saying that, that's a warning sign. Like, okay, what's your treasure? Where's your treasure? What is my treasure? Because again, if, if our lives are lived by this, this, this driving for accumulation of things to be happy, then, then again, you're not living for the glory of God's name. You're living for the glory of your name. So, so your needs will not be shaped by what, what brings glory to God, but rather by, by what elevates your sense of self-worth or, or your sense of self-value. Or your sense of, well, I want to be happy. 
will this make me happy, right? Like, that's living for your name, not for the glory of God's name. Here's an example as I was thinking through this in my life. Um, Amy and I are going on uh, 14 years of marriage here in just a couple of months. And so when we were first married, we lived like probably most young couples do um, in an apartment. So we had an apartment just up the street here on, on, uh, on school. Um, it, it was nothing fancy. It wasn't a dump. It was, it was nice. It was a nice little apartment for us to live in. Like we were happy with it. Um, and we, we had that apartment and we had the joy of having shared walls with neighbors, like and all the joy that comes with, with that. In fact, I remember one time one of our neighbors left and their alarm clock was going off and they were gone for like a week on vacation and at like three in the morning you hear that thing going off and like, we got to move, we got to move, you know? And so, um, so we had that joy of just kind of living in, in that apartment, apartment type living. We had fun, like it was just fun. And, and all of our friends that we were doing life with at that time, we were just kind of all going through the same stage of life. They're, so we were all kind of just recently married. Um, we didn't have kids really. Um, uh, we were just kind of apartment living. Um, but, but then as we kind of got older, right, like all of our friends started kind of buying these homes, right? And they started kind of moving away. Like, so actually, Amy and I's closest friends, they bought an apartment like right next to us. Like, so for about two years, we just were in and out. Like, it was, it was awesome. But then they moved, right? Like, so they bought a house and, and we're still living in an apartment. And so I remember like that thinking of like, huh, like there's jealousy that started, oh, man, all my friends are having homes now and garages and all this, you know, and, and a washer and dryer in their house, you know, saying like I have to pay a dollar every time they need to wash. Like, so I started thinking through that, and I'm like, we got to get a house. Got to get a house. They're, they're all getting a house. We got to get a house. So we bought a house, right? We bought a house. Not be, and, and, and my thinking through all that was it, I wasn't looking for a home really like, man, what can I do ministry-wise with this house? Like, how can we, can we have people into this? It was just like, we've got we to get a home. They're all living in the homes. I can't be the only one living in an apartment still. That's embarrassing. So got to get a house. All right, I can't be the only one in an apartment anymore. Listen to the alarm clock going off at three in the morning. And, and so we bought a home, and, and I'm grateful for the home that we have. Really am. Still there. We love it. Grateful for it. But full disclosure, even now, right? I, I feel that, that, that pulling in me. When I, when I drive around town and I see big, bigger houses, right, that are for sale, I'm like, ooh, you know, and like, that's kind of looks nice. Like, oh, attached garage. Oh, man, like that could be, awesome. you know, and I started thinking through that. And, and again, so our friends were kind of doing life together. They, they're in bigger houses than we are, you know what I'm saying? So I, I start wrestling with that. Like, oh, man, that would be nice to kind of put ours up for sale. And let's kind of move up. Like our house was a good starter home. Like whatever that means. I don't know what a starter home means, but like, like we're, we're kind of, that we, that's where we are. And I start rationalizing that in my mind, right? And so I start feeling that pull, not because of, okay, my, my, my heart is thinking, okay, what, what, could I, what could we purchase to bring glory to God's name? I'm, I'm seriously thinking through the kingdom of self in that moment. Like I want I don't want to be the only one living, like, in this house, I, you know, and there in that house. Like, I think that way. And sin, it's sin in my life that I've confessed all the time. Now, the problem here is I lay all this out because we might be like, well, I'm moving. <laughs> my house is up for sale. Like, uh, man, Matt's killing me today, right? Like, um, that's, again, that's not the problem here. The problem is not moving from an apartment to a home or even looking to purchase um, a, a home with a little bit more room. That's, that's not the issue here. The issue, again, we're going to pull it back to where the root cause is, is the heart in all of it. The heart in all of it. See, so often for me, I'm a very self-centered and selfish person. Like, so often my life just revolves around me. What, what I think I need to be happy. So, so, so why do I need to buy a larger home? Well, because, well, they have one, and I want it too, right? And I start sounding like a three-year-old. See, see, my treasure in that moment, and, th- and this is laid out in, in a, a plethora of other examples in my life, but what's happening in that moment is my treasure is not in Christ. It just isn't. I'm not finding my, my joy in who he is and who he says I am. I'm, I'm, I'm saying... And thinking that, man, my acceptance can't be just fully what, what Jesus says I am and who I am in Christ. It's got to be, in fact, I live here and drive this. And I ha- you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling away from him where he's not my treasure anymore. See, if, 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 my, if my treasure is not Christ in these moments, it's materialism that, that I'm looking at to be my treasure. And then how faulty is that? Because, man, I get the, the biggest house ever, but it's still going to one day rot and fall apart. I mean, it's just life. That's what happens. But yet, that's where we put our hope so often. 
see, if Christ is my treasure, if Christ is your treasure, do you, do you see how this begins to, to shape what our needs are, what we truly think we need? So, so before you pray for your needs, ask yourself first, okay, what, what is my treasure? What, what am I chasing after? And then let's jump down here. Stay in Matthew 6, but jump down now to verse 25. We're going to see two more questions to ask. So verse 25, Matthew 6, he goes on, says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Again, just really quick, we just got done doing a series on Ecclesiastes. So Solomon was the wealthiest person ever, right? Had everything at his disposal. And so he's, he's pulling back to that. He says, yeah, I tell you, even Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. Gentiles is just a reference to those who are not believers, those who are not trusting in Christ. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So so the second thing you want to ask yourself before you pray for your needs is this. Who am I trusting in? Okay? So so what is my treasure? And and now who who am I trusting in? See, what's Jesus trying to teach us here in in these few verses that we just read? He's trying to teach us to say, okay, stop trusting in yourselves and trust that God loves you and that he knows what you need. How comforting is that? That God, again, God, our Father, cares for us, loves us, and says, I know what you need. I, I know what you need. Trust me, right? Trust me. Don't, don't be anxious over these things. Trust me. See, our sinfulness so often causes us to, to not trust anything or anyone. We're so conditioned in our, in our culture to not want to rely on anyone or anything to take care of us. Or if we have to, it's, it's kind of like the sign of weakness or failure in our lives if we have to rely on someone else. Again, this comes down to a heart issue. Who, who is Lord over your life? Who is your king? Who is your ultimate provider? Who are you relying in? Who are you trusting in? See, for the believer, it's, it's Christ. We trust him, which, which means my, my trust for provision ultimately comes from him to satisfy me. It's, it's his life, it's his death, it's his resurrection, which gives me, gives us the life that we need and a future to hope in. And, and follow me here. If we can trust Christ with our eternal future, th- then we can certainly trust him with our physical life and needs, can't we? If, if we are entrusting our very souls to the God of the universe through Christ that we have that we have an eternal inheritance afforded to us, right? Then we can trust, we can certainly trust him with our physical needs. And that, that's what Jesus is trying to draw us to. L- listen, who are you praying to? Who are you believing in? Who are you trusting in? Like, look, look at what he's done. Look at what he continually shows you to prove his faithfulness to you, his, his willingness to show love to you and care for you. Who are you trusting in? If we can trust him for our eternal future, we can trust him for our physical needs here on this earth. Now, this isn't a passage, though, to call us to be lazy, right? Uh, and just say, well, man, God, God's going to provide, so I'm just going to sit around. I'm going to wait for those Amazon packages to just start showing up on my door, right? Because he knows what I need, so I'm just not going to do anything. I'm just going to trust him. That's not what this passage is talking about either. But to call to say all the things of this world are not what, what I'm ultimately after, right? They're not what I'm ultimately after. My eyes are set on higher things, on the eternal thing. So I'm going to chase him. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
I'm going I'm to grasp and rest in the fact that I can't earn my, my, my good behavior. I can't earn my acceptance with God through my good behavior. I'm seeking his kingdom, seeking his righteousness. I'm trusting in him. My eyes are set on the things not on this world, but on the things that are in heaven. That's where our heart is. That's where Jesus is trying to, to, to draw our attention. What am I trusting in? Who are you trusting in? Which leads us to our last question that we should ask before we ask for our needs, and it's this, what am I seeking? So what am I seeking? See, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I think back to, to last week, we, we surrender ourselves to him. We surrender ourselves to him. Right prayer is surrendering our, our kingdom and our desires and our will, knowing that his kingdom and his desires and his will is better so, so we lay down ourselves before him because we say there's something better out there than even what I can attain for myself. I'm surrendering to him because it's better. See, if our eyes and our hearts are, are fixed on, on that which is most valuable, then, then we're not going to get sidetracked and distracted by the peripheral things on this earth. Think of it this way. I don't know if this example will or illustration will help drive this home, but it, it did for me as I was thinking through this. Like if you're sitting home one night and you're just on the couch and you're just watching TV and the tornado sirens come on, right? And you know it's not a drill. Like it's a, man, a there's a tornado coming, all right? And like in that moment when you hear those sirens, you're, you're not going to get distracted by the car commercial that comes on TV in that moment. Like the, when, when, if a tornado is coming your way, you're not going to be like, ooh, man, leather seats. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're not, you're not thinking, ooh, I need to go check my credit limit right now. Let me go, let me go work some budget numbers here right now. Like, I got I to gotta see if I can squeeze this in, like, while a tornado's barreling down on your home. Like, you're, that's, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to do that in that moment. Like, you're not thinking in that moment, like, well, man, my neighbor just got a new car. I need to get that new car, all right? I, I, I need to show him up. Like, we're not thinking that because all that matters in that moment, the only thing of ultimate value in that moment is your safety, that's, that's what, that's what is the highest value in that moment, getting the safety and getting your family, if they're in there, to safety as well. That's what's most valuable. Nothing else matters. Your eyes are set on seeking what matters most, finding shelter, and just collecting the things that you need to live and ride out the storm. Like, like, so, so what are you seeking in life? What are you seeking in life? Are you, are you seeking your kingdom or the furtherance of God's kingdom? Are you resting in God's acceptance of you through Jesus? Or are you trying to earn his love and acceptance through your good and moral behavior? Again, see how this shapes how we pray. Like, like if God's kingdom, his glory, and his holiness is, is ultimately all that matters, then, then what we're going to ask for are things that just help us continue to maintain his holiness and his glory and his awesomeness, right? It, that's, that's what Proverbs 30 was saying. Don't, don't give me poverty or riches, Lest, lest I have too much and think I don't need you, or lest you give me too little and I steal and defame your name. Like, give me just what I need to survive. Give me just what I need in this life so that my joy is full in you, not in the things of this world. This is, this is how his name shapes how we pray. If we're seeking our kingdom and our name, then what we ask for is going to be radically different than, than if we're seeking God's kingdom and his name to be glorified. So, so what is your treasure? What are you trusting in or who are you trusting in? And then what are you seeking? See, once our minds and hearts gravitate around the, the glory of God's name being what is ultimate, then we can freely ask, right? Freely ask, knowing that what we're asking for is, is in alignment with God's will. You see, it's after this teaching that, that Jesus does in Matthew 6 that he says in chapter 7, look at chapter 7, verse 7, that Jesus then says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, they will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. I mean, God gives us what we need when we ask for it and when it's in alignment with his glory and his name. Now, now, will this mean that we receive it right when we ask, right? Because I remember growing up getting frustrated, thinking like, why, why, why isn't God giving this to me right now, right? I'm, I feel like I'm in his will. This is in alignment with him. Like, why, like, 
What's he holding off for? Like, I would get frustrated. So this doesn't mean that, that even when we pray and ask that he's going to give it to us right now. Again, God is not a genie in a bottle, right? Like, he is not subservient to our will. And again, even this, this right way of praying isn't, isn't conditioning him to our, our will, right? So, so again, God owes us nothing. He owes you nothing, right? Like, he is king. He is Lord. But, but he's trying to lay out for us, okay, but here's how we approach him. And and there are going to be needs in your life. And so when there's needs in your life, here's how you approach him. Will he give you everything you want in that moment or everything you need in that moment? Not always. And we probably testimony after testimony in here saying, yeah, there there was waiting. There was time I had to be patient and had to continue to be persistent. In fact, Jesus is teaching in Matthew 7 there, persistence in prayer. He's he's saying knock, right? Like knock. So, So let me ask you, when you knock on a door, do you usually only knock once? Like, is it usually just like that and you're done? No, like, it's, it's always, like, right, it's, it's a few knocks, right? And if they don't come to the door, it's like you, you hit a little louder, right? And you're knocking a few times. Like, that's what Jesus is laying out before. Like, it's this continual persistence in prayer, knocking, okay, uh, pleading, being persistent, asking, here's my needs. I feel this is in alignment with your name, with your glory. I need this, God. Would you give this to me? All right, I'm not responding. Okay, I'm going to keep persisting. I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep knocking. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Now, it's, it's not saying that, that God's being cruel in that moment. Like, God's not hiding around the door, like, hoping you just go away, right? Like, have you ever done that with neighbors, right? No? No? Nobody else? Like, all right, have they gone yet? Look out the curtain, right? Like, he's not doing that with us, right? Like, that's not what's happening in that moment. He's not being cruel because he's not answering those prayers in that moment. But sometimes it's through our persistence that he's even teaching us, okay, trust me, seek after me, rely on me, keep coming after me, because I'm building something even greater in you, even through your persistence in prayer. And it's always for our good. It's always for our good. So, so if God's not answering your prayer for what you need in your life right that moment, it's not because he's cruel. It's because he's good. And right now he knows you don't need this right now. You need something else. I'm going to give that to you. And maybe what you need right now is patience. Like it's always for our good. But keep persisting. Keep chasing. Keep, keep pursuing him. Keep knocking. I love that we can go to God in prayer. I love that he teaches us to ask, to ask him for what we need. I love that he says he, he loves to provide. Like that, that's a father, right? That's a, father, that's a good father who loves his children, who loves when they, when they go to him, when they trust him, and when they're seeking after him. This is what it is to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. That's what it's about. Right alignment with God's name, his glory, his renown, his holiness. I pray that that just shapes how we pray and how we ask when we're in need. Let's pray. So, Father, we come before you this morning. Again, just want to pause that we can even come to you right now and that we can call you our Father. So God, we we thank you and praise you that you are good. We praise you and thank you that you love us more than we could ever dare even dream. We thank you that, as we even sung this morning, that though our sins are many, your mercy is more. That's just abundantly showing us your love for us, your grace that is lavished on us, that you're for our good. And so God, I pray that as as we pursue you, as we chase after you, God, that that your holiness and your name and your renown will be what what shapes how we pray and why we pray. I ask that we would would ask these questions, like what what is my treasure? What are we chasing after in this life? Who am I trusting in? What am I seeking after? These These are real questions that we need to be asking ourselves, I would say almost on a weekly basis, if not daily, because the the pull to self is so alive in us, the, the pull to want to live for my joy and my happiness and what I think I need to be, that's so alive in me that, that I know I need to put it to death, but it's, it's there. And so these are questions we need to ask ourselves all the time, evaluate, are we pursuing you? Is Jesus our treasure? Is your kingdom what we're seeking? Is your righteousness what we're after and what we're resting in, not our own? So God, begin us there, start us there, 
And then, then I pray that we would just then come freely to you, saying, here's what I need. Would you provide? And would you teach me what, when you don't give right away? Would you, would you make abundantly clear what you are trying to teach me and teach us? So God, we thank you that you love us. Even in, in this petition of saying, give us this day our daily bread is, is evidence of your love. You want to provide. You want us to come to you. And so God, we thank you for your love for us. Be glorified and honored. In Christ's name we come. Amen. So as we continue in worship here, we're going to sing and we're going to give. And so we encourage everybody to give generously because, man, God is generous. We say this almost every week. This is the, the, the reason why there's a joy to give is because God is amazing and God has given us everything and he's showered his blessings on us and, and his mercy is, is more than even our sins. And so that, that stills within us is joy to say, ah, oh, man, I want to I live open-handedly. I want to live sacrificially. I want to I wanna give it all to show, again, that he's my treasure. And so, again, this, this is a revealing to us like where, where we hold on to too tightly. So, so even with our finances, if we say, nope, I'm holding it on to, because I want to build up my bank account to whatever it may be in order for me to have a sense of safety and security. Again, that's, a, that's that warning flag. Like, man, are you trusting Christ? Is he your treasure? It's not, it's not a call to live recklessly or, or, or crazy with our finances. It's just to say, okay, is, is the way that I give, is it reflecting that Jesus is my treasure? And that's a work of the Spirit in your life. I can't come before you and say, well, if you're given this amount and not this amount, then you're in sin. I can just say, let the Holy Spirit work in your life and pursue him and ask him. We want to grow in, in the grace of generosity here. And it is a work of grace because we like to hold on. I like to hold on for those things. And so pray that God would just release us of that. And it would be a, a testimony that, man, he's our treasure. We have two weeks left of our debt reduction campaign this month. And so, again, we're, we're looking to clear that board. And so, Welcome Center, after the service, grab one of those envelopes. Let's, let's get that thing cleared out. Again, this is all going towards paying down our debt here. We want to do as much as we can during the month of March. And so, for our members, regular attenders, let me really encourage you, if you haven't yet, um, you got two Sundays left to, to grab those, grab an envelope, fill that, and then turn it in at some point this month. And so, again, all going towards just paying down the debt of our building here. Well, let's stand, let's sing, let's give, and let's just make much of, of who Christ is and what he's done for us. Let's sing of his salvation here.
about 24 hours of prayer. I'm serious about that. I'd love to get every hour filled with people from our church coming and, and praying. And so if you're new and you're like, okay, what is this? So Good Friday beginning midnight, we'll be meeting in the upper fireside room and we'll have someone that's leading just that hour um, to walk through just ways to just pray as a, as a group for Easter Sunday, for, for just for the message, for people to be saved. And, and it's just a good time just to come and pray together. So we've done this about last three or four years. It's, it's one of my favorite times of the year. So if you've never been able to take part in this, again, we give you 24 hours uh, to find a time that you can come just for an hour. Um, and, and here's what I'll say too. That hour goes by really quick. You might think like an hour praying and like the hour ends, you're like, I can't believe that it's an hour already. It really goes quick. And so come, sign up for that. Go to the info center. You can sign up for whatever hour you'd like to come and, uh, and, and just pray with a group of brothers and sisters for the Easter Sunday service. So please take advantage of that on Good Friday, uh, March 30th here. Um, sign up for Growth Track. We've got April open. Again, we, we, part of our baptisms and new members are because of Growth Track. And, and uh, so it's exciting. And it's a way for people to start getting connected here and be a part of, of just the life of the church. And so if you're, if you're new here and you're looking like, man, I just want to know who you guys are, know a little bit more about how I can connect here. Um, sign up for Growth Track. Again, at the Info Center. We meet every Sunday following the service about 11.15 to noon. Um, if you're a longtime member here, sign up for that. Be a part of it. We'd love to have you go through it as well. It's been hugely helpful for the people that have already gone through it. And so we've got about half our spots still open in April. May is starting to fill up as well. So if, if any of those months work for you, go ahead and sign up for those as well. And just let us connect and let's grow together. So we close here with Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21, which says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday.